and welcome to Daily News Simplified, an answer to what, why and how of the newspaper analysis from the UPSC perspective. Here we have taken up important news and articles from the previous week's newspaper that is the Hindu and the Indian Express. Topics which we are going to discuss are displayed on your screen. Let's begin the discussion. Now let's start our session with our first article which appeared on page number 9 in the Indian Express dated 13th February. And this article is about the importance of myths. Context of this article is that India is planning to launch a global initiative to encourage the consumption and production of millets. Mira, that is Millet International Initiative for Research and Awareness, will be aimed at coordinating millet research program at the international level. Now, if you will refer to GS paper 3, topic of agriculture, and allied sector is a prominent theme from the perspective of both preliminary and mains examination. As in 2019, UPSC has asked the question based on advantages of fertigation in agriculture. Now try to attempt this question and let us know your answer in the comment box given below. Also, theme of agriculture is equally important from the perspective of mains examination. As in 2021, It has asked questions based on challenges pertaining crop diversification. So in this discussion, we will look into the benefits of millets, then what are the causes of their low production and consumption, then we'll see few futuristic conclusions. However, apart from this, we will broadly look into the challenges pertaining to Indian agriculture sector and we'll end our discussion with a way ahead. So let's begin our discussion. So let's see what are millets. The term millet is used to describe small grain cereals like sorghum that is jawar, next is pearl millet that is bajra, then finger millet that is ragi, then foxtail, little millet, kodo millet etc. So these are the types of millets. Now in India millets are mainly a kharif crop. During 2018 and 19 three millet crops that is bajra, jawar and ragi. All these three crops accounted for about 7% of the gross cropped area in the country and their individual share is for bajra it is 3.67%, for jawar it's 2.13% and for ragi it's 0.48%. Now let's quickly see India's millets map. Now you can see that jawar is grown mainly in Maharashtra, Karnataka, Rajasthan and Tamil Nadu while bajra grown mainly in Rajasthan, UP, Haryana and Gujarat and these are the types of different millets in India. Now let's further move into our discussion and let's discuss important benefits of millets. Now as you know that millets have been identified as a climate resilient crop. Why? because they can adapt to extreme weather conditions such as heat, droughts, floods, etc. Also, they require less water, less fertilizers and pesticides than other crops and can be grown on marginal lands. So as a result, it helps in reducing carbon footprint. That means millet is useful in mitigating climate change. And because of this, they are also known as Miracle greens or crops of the future. Now next benefit is health benefit. How? As millets are highly nutritious and can help in managing and preventing various health conditions like obesity, diabetes, etc. Why? Because they are rich in fiber which is known to improve gut microbiota. Also they are rich in protein, vitamin, minerals. They are good source of complex carbohydrates. Also, they have low glycamic index. How it is helpful? Glycamic index is a measure of how much blood sugar levels spike after consuming a food item. Then processed rice or wheat. A low glycamic diet can help in controlling weight and blood sugar levels. And consequently, it will reduce the risk of heart diseases and even cancers. Also, millets are gluten free and that suit people with gluten allergy. Next benefit is that it will improve food security. Now you know that millets have been cultivated in India for thousands of years and have been an important food source 
for millions of people, especially in rural areas. They are affordable and accessible source of nutrition and can be grown in diverse agroclimatic conditions. Now, as you have seen that they are highly nutritious, plus they can be stored for a long time. So millets are an important food security crop that can help in reducing malnutrition and hunger. Next benefit is that it will help to increase income generation. How? Now millets have a high demand in the market, both in India and globally. Why? Due to their nutritional value and climate resilience. So by cultivating millets, farmers can generate additional income and diversify their cropping system. So rather focusing only on wheat and rice. Also, it can create employment opportunities in processing, packaging and marketing, which can benefit rural communities. Next benefit is biodiversity conservation. Now you have already seen that millets are diverse group of grains that include several varieties and species. So by cultivating millets, farmers can conserve biodiversity and preserve their traditional knowledge and practices. Another benefit is that it will enhance soil health and improve fertility. How? Now millets have a deep root system that helps in improving soil structure and fertility. Also they have a low requirement for fertilizers and pesticides which automatically reduce the cost of cultivation and prevent soil degradation. So by rotating millets with other crops, farmer can improve soil health and reduce the risk of soil borne diseases. And the next benefit is versatility. Now how it is a benefit? Because it can be used as a feed and a fodder for animals and food for human beings. It can be used in a variety of dishes from breakfast to dinner and even snacks and desserts. Now another important benefit of millet is Political significance. How? As millet is grown mainly in low income and developing countries like Asia and Africa, and they are part of food basket of about 60 crore people across the globe. So, by proposing the resolution to celebrate 2023 as the International Year of Millets, India pitched itself as a leader of this group. This is similar to the Indian initiative on the 121 nation that is International Solar Alliance. Now we have seen that millets are highly nutritious and can withstand adverse climatic condition. Also in India, millets have been traditional staple crop for centuries, but their production and consumption have decreased significantly. So let's discuss some reasons behind their low production and consumption. The first reason behind their low production and consumption is change in dietary habits. Now with the rise of urbanization, a shift towards a more westernized diet. So there has been a decline in the consumption of traditional foods such as millets. Also, there has been a shift in consumption pattern towards more protein based foods such as pulses, milk, egg, fish and etc. Next challenge is lack of awareness. Now millets are often seen as a poor man's food or food for livestock. Why? Because there is a lack of awareness among urban population about the nutritional value and health benefits of millets which has led to a decline in their consumption. Next challenge is more focus on rice and wheat. How? As owing to Green Revolution and National Food Security Act 2013. Now in this, two-third of India's population receive up to 5 kg of wheat or rice per person per month at Rs 2 and Rs 3 per kg respectively. So tilting the scales against millets. Next challenge is inconvenience in food preparation. Now if we see in comparison with wheat dough, because the gluten protein makes the wheat dough more cohesive and elastic. So the resultant breads come out light and fluffy, which is not the case with Bajra or Jawar. Next challenge is low productivity. Now for farmers, low per hectare yields, that is the national average is roughly 1 ton for Jawar, 1.5 ton for Bajra, 1.7 ton for Ragi 
as against 3.5 tons for wheat and 4 tons for paddy. Now you can see the difference between the per hectare yield. Next challenge is low procurement. Now the quantity of coarse grain procured for the central pool and distributed under National Food Security Act has been negligible. Last is lack of umbrella coverage under minimum support price. Now government declares MSP for sorghum, pearl millet, barley and ragi only thus making farmers hesitant to grow for other crops. Now having discussed the benefits of millets and the reason behind their low production and consumption, let's discuss few strategies to promote nutri cereals. The first one is special agribusiness zone for millets. In this, focus should be on development of particular millets which is popularly cultivated in local areas. For example, sorghum in Telangana, finger millet in Karnataka, pearl millet in Gujarat and small millets in Madhya Pradesh. So these special agribusiness zones can develop around farmer producer organization, farm gate level processing facilities, warehouse units and value added food products. Next suggestion is promoting organic millets to cater increased demand for the consumers. Next is to explore trade opportunities. Why? Because export of Indian millets has not been up to mark as compared to other cereal grains. Why? Due to poor quality. So for this, farmers need to be educated about quality concerns at all stages of production and harvesting. Next is federating millets farmers that is farmer producer organizations then expanding the coverage of small millets under minimum support price why because we have already discussed that government declares minimum support price for sorghum pearl millet barley and ragi only next is promoting contract farming for millets now having discussed facets related to millets production in india let us look into the contemporary challenges lying ahead for the agriculture sector in India. Now let's discuss major contemporary challenges faced by agricultural sector one by one. The first is, now as you know, rising temperature along with increased occurrences of extreme weather conditions have made climate change a major threat to Indian agriculture which lead to productivity loss. Apart from hampering the biological growth of the plants, climate change also results in crop damage by increasing pest and diseases attacks. It has been observed that small and marginal farmers are more prone to these impacts. Second challenge is agricultural waste management. How? As crop residue burnings in northern state increase the air pollution levels. The best example of this is stubble burning near Delhi and NCR region, deteriorating the air quality index of that region. Also, high pollution level in air will further contribute to global warming and create health hazards. Next challenge is fragmented land holding. Now, the average size of land holding in the country has come down to 1.08 hectare in 2015 and 16 from 2.28 hectare in 1970 and 71. And you should know that marginal and small holdings together constitute 86% of total holdings in India. So what will happen? That fragmented land occupancy structures make it almost impossible for farmers to widely invest in heavy infrastructure like drip irrigation, bulk inputs, etc. thus adversely affecting productivity. Next major challenge is storage infrastructure. Now the current availability of cold storage facility in India is highly skewed. Why? Because 70% of the country's total capacity limited to 4 states that is UP, West Bengal, Punjab and Gujarat. Whereas states like Maharashtra and Karnataka with large export potential do not have adequate facilities. Next challenge is non-development of food processing industry. Now, 
as food processing industry is a sunrise industry and the demand for processed food in india is likely to increase steadily with rapid urbanization rising per capita income and more women joining the force despite all these benefits food processing industry in india is currently at a nascent stage accounting for less than 10% of the total food produced in the country next major challenge is disguised unemployment how because agricultural sector engages 49% of the total labor force in the country and its contribution to overall gva that is gross value added is only 17% so what it reflects it reflects the over dependence of indian labor force on agriculture resulting in hidden or disguised unemployment in the sector and thus lower labor productivity next challenge is food inflation and volatility in food prices now as agricultural production in india is still heavily dependent on rainfall and its fertile distribution adverse climatic condition like drought flood and unseasonal rains tend to disrupt both aggregate supply and supply chains what will impart large volatility to food inflation trajectory in india next major challenge is post harvest losses what is post harvest losses wastage of food products due to inefficient post harvest practices which is one of the important factor behind high food inflation in india and wastage take place at all levels of the food value chain starting from the level of farmers to the level of transporters wholesalers and retailers everyone is involved next challenge is food quality and safety safeguards now asian and middle eastern countries remain the major destinations for indian agricultural exports whereas entry into the markets of the us and european union has remained a challenge why due to high sanitary and phytosanitary norms resulting in high refusal or rejection rates for indian products and the last and a very important challenge is public investment why because capital formation holds the key to agricultural growth and development and it is not about the agriculture for the rise of any sector capital formation is the base and in indian agriculture as a percentage of agriculture gva it has moderated in the recent past the share of public sector is much lower than private sector in capital formation in agriculture so in crux this sector has confronted various challenges mitigation of which requires a holistic policy approach for instance crop productivity in india is much lower than other advanced and emerging market economies due to various factors like segment in land holding lower farm mechanization lower public and private investment in agriculture second the current over production of crops like rice wheat and sugar cane has led to rapid depletion of groundwater table soil degradation and massive air pollution raising questions about environmental sustainability of current agricultural practices in india third despite surplus production in many of the commodities food inflation and volatility in prices continue to remain high causing inconvenience to consumer and low and fluctuating income for farmers now empirical analysis carried out reveals that supply side hindrances like low public investment inadequate cold storage capacity and nascent food processing industry are partly responsible for volatility in food prices in india now let's see few suggestions to overcome these challenges faced by our agriculture sector in india now to address these challenges would require a second green revolution which should be focused on the agriculture water and energy nexus thus making agriculture more climate resistant and environmentally sustainable second use of biotechnology and breeding this will be important in developing eco friendly disease resistant climate resilient and more nutritious and diversified crop varieties second is wider use of digital technology and extension services which would be helpful in information sharing and generating awareness among the farmers next is better post harvest loss management 
and a revamp of cooperative movement through formation of farmer producer organization that is FPOs. Why? Because they can arrest the volatility in food prices and farmers' income and help harness the true potential of Indian agriculture. Now let's come to the second article which appeared on page number 11 in the Indian Express dated 17th February. Now this article is about factors moderating current account deficit that is CAD. Now as per this article, while data released by government on Wednesday shows that Indian exports and imports declined by 6.59% and 3.63% respectively in January. There are indications that current account deficit, that is, the difference between exports and imports of goods and services, will moderate the global slowdown triggered by the rising inflation and interest rates. Now, if you will relate it to GS Paper 3, topic of issues related to development and employment has been mentioned. Further, topic of balance of payment and associated concepts like current account deficit and capital account deficit are important from the perspective of UPSC examination. As you can see, it has asked question based on capital accounts in 2013 and current account in 2014. Now, we will solve these questions once we understand the concept of balance of payment. Well, as we know, current account deficit as mentioned in the news is primarily related to export and import of the country. So in this discussion, we will look into basics of balance of payment, then why export-led growth is significant in achieving positive balance of payment. Then we'll see what are the key challenges to the export-led growth model and what is the prudent solutions to mitigate these challenges. Now let's start our discussion with what is balance of payments. Now I can see it is a record of economic transactions between residents and non-residents for a period of one year. That means it is a record of all the economic transactions occurring inside India as well as transactions from abroad of which India is a part. Now, as we know that balance of payment comprises current account and capital account. Now, let us understand what constitute these accounts. Now, in the current account, first is balance of trade. And this is difference between export and imports. Now, if export value is 100 and import value is 50. So, if export is more than import, it is trade surplus and vice versa is trade deficit. Second is balance of invisibles. Now what does it mean? It is an international transactions that does not include an exchange of tangible goods and it constitutes services, profit, interest, dividend, remittances, donations, gifts. Now in case of India, trade deficit that is balance of trade remains higher then invisible trade, that is balance of invisibles. Hence, we have current account deficit. Now, let's see what capital account composed of. It composed of foreign direct investment, foreign portfolio investment, that is FPI, external commercial borrowing, that is ECB, and loans from multilateral institutions. Now, let's understand two possibilities for balance of payment. If current account deficit is more than capital account surplus, then we have negative balance of payment. But if we have current account deficit less than capital account surplus, then we have positive balance of payment. Now, having understood the basic concepts, let's try to solve previous year MCQs. Question says, which of the following constitute capital accounts? First is foreign loans, second, foreign direct investment, third, private remittances, and fourth is portfolio investment. Now, if you can recall that remittances is important part of current account and not of capital account, then you can easily eliminate option three from the given options. So A is not your answer, C is not your answer, D is not your answer and you left with option B. That is your correct answer. Now let's come to the next question. Question says with reference to balance of payments, which of the following constitutes and constitute the current account? Now as you can see, foreign asset and loans from multilateral institution comes under capital account and not under current account. So here you can easily eliminate option 2. That means option B is not your answer. 
and option D is not your answer and you know that balance of trade and balance of invisible comes under current account. So your correct answer is option C, 1 and 3 only. Now, as evident from this discussion that India's current account deficit is mainly due to high level of imports when compared to the exports. So in order to have the solution for this challenge, India must reverse the path of export-led growth. So let's begin the second part of our discussion in which we will be taking up why there is a need for export-led growth, what are the constraints and we'll end our discussion with a way ahead. Now as you all know that India's vision of becoming dollar $5 trillion economy by 2024 is intricately linked with an export-oriented approach and how as greater integration with global value chains will promote exports and that will enable India to attract more investment, create job boost exports and hence sustain virtuous economic cycle. Now let's understand few important aspects of India's trade as India's share in world exports has remained stagnant at 1.6% in the last decade. Also, India is still critically dependent on import of critical goods such as pulses, oil seeds, electronic goods, APIs that is active pharmaceutical integrants which shows lack of self-sufficiency of Indian economy. Also, India's export basket is dominated by capital intensive goods such as petroleum products, gems, jewelry, etc. rather than labor intensive goods such as textiles, leather. So under India's export basket, capital intensive is more than labor intensive. Then imports into India is much higher than exports. Thus, it leads to current account deficit. So these are few important aspects of India's trade. Now let us understand what is the need for export-led model? Now, the first point under need for export-led growth model is empirical evidence. Why? As countries such as Japan, South Korea, Singapore have been able to sustain higher economic growth by following export-led strategy. In the recent times, such an export-led strategy has benefited both bigger economies such as China as well as smaller economies such as Vietnam. So India can also be the part. Next need is shift from consumption led to investment and export driven model. Why? Because India's growth drivers highlight that its economic growth has been primarily propelled by domestic demand, which accounts for 60% of India's GDP. However, export accounts for only 12% of India's GDP. You can see the difference between the two. And it should also be recognized that an economy with only $2,000 per capita income will not be able to expand simply based on domestic demand. Moreover, too much focus on domestic demand might strengthen imports faster than exports which could potentially lead to widening current account deficit. Next is conducive environment which is in terms of decline in exports from China on accounts of US-China trade war. Also, there is rising labor cost and growing anti-China sentiment. Next need is boost Make in India and Assembly in India. Now by integrating Assemble in India for the world into Make in India, India can raise its export share market to about 3.5% by 2025 and 6% by 2030. Also, India can create well-paid jobs about 4 crore by 2025 and 8 crore by 2030. Next is innovation and efficiency. Why? As exporters would be required to innovate and adopt new technologies to boost exports. Now having seen the need for export-led model, now let us understand what are the challenges in boosting exports. Now, the challenges in boosting export sector are from supply side and also from demand side. So let's discuss in detail what are the challenges under supply side and demand side. The first challenge under supply side is dominance of door firms in MSME sector. 
Now, MSME accounts for about 40% of exports and 45% of manufacturing output. However, these MSME face problem with respect to factors of production such as land, labor and capital. Plus, most of the MSMEs use obsolete technology which leads to poor efficiency and competitiveness. Next challenge is higher logistic cost. Now, India's logistic cost as a share of GDP is 14%, which is high when compared to developed nation, where it ranges between 8 to 10%. So what happened? High logistic cost in turn reduces the overall competitiveness of Indian economy. Next challenge is trade facilitation. Now, this involves reducing the number of documents needed for trade. That means it will reduce the time to export also cost of exports. Further, in India, trade facilitation as measured by trading across borders, which is quite poor. And trading across border is one of the parameters for measuring World Bank's ease of doing business. Next challenge is poor innovation. Why? Because India spends hardly around 0.7% of its GDP on research and development, which is quite lower in comparison to USA, that is 2.1%, China, that is 2.8%, etc. So why we need high spending on research and development? Because it will lead to improvement in innovation ecosystem, which would further improve manufacturing competitiveness and help India to manufacture high quality goods for the global market. Now, next challenge is lack of market intelligence related to consumer preference in exports market. For example, Sweetness in Indian mangoes may be liked by Indians, but it is not necessarily in demand in many countries. Next challenge is identification challenge. Now, what is that? In this, each district of a country has a potential equivalent to that of a small country in boosting exports. However, there is a lack of focus on identifying export clusters within a state. Next challenge is lack of coordination among multiple government ministries and departments involved in boosting exports. Next challenge is adverse impact on free trade agreements. Now, you should know that some free trade agreements with countries such as Japan, Singapore, etc. has led to inverted duty structure. Now, what is this inverted duty structure? It is a structure where inputs or raw materials are taxed higher than finished goods. So, what will happen? it will hurt the competitiveness of Indian manufacturers, especially in sectors such as textiles and apparel. Why? Because this makes an Indian-made product more expensive than an imported finished product. So these countries like Japan, South Korea led to inverted duty structure. And what will happen? In turn, it increased imports of finished goods and discouraged domestic manufacturing. Now see important challenges under demand side. Now under this, the first is rising protectionist policies in importing countries. How? By increasing import duties and raising quota limits in export markets. Next challenge is easier market access to Indian competitors. How? As goods from countries such as Bangladesh, Vietnam, enter into export markets such as European Union, USA at almost Zero custom duty. However, Indian goods enter such markets with comparatively higher custom duty and thus our goods become uncompetitive. So this is the reason why India's exports of textiles and leather to USA and European Union has been declining on account of this. Next is World Trade Organization norms. Why this is a challenge? as because of indiscriminate application of sanitary and phytosanitary norms by other countries against Indian product. Let me tell you the best example of this. Basmati and non-Basmati rice exports to US have been rejected multiple times on the ground of low hygiene standards. Similarly, the issue of pesticides residues is frequently raised by European Union and Japan. Now, having seen the need for the export-led growth model and the challenges faced by export-led growth model, what is the need of the RS? Prudent suggestions which can align India's vision of becoming a $5 trillion economy 
by 2024. So let's discuss few suggestions. Now first suggestion is to improve trade competitiveness. How? By improving access to factors of production like land, labor, etc. And to reduce logistic costs. As currently for India it is 14% of GDP to global benchmark that is 8% of GDP. So the expected one is 8% of GDP. Also to improve ease of doing business. Next suggestion is to protect domestic market from the import cheap foreign goods. How? With the help of strong and effective technical regulations and also by safeguarding trade with the help of steps like anti-dumping duties, safeguard duties. Next is better inter-ministerial coordination. Now, Ministry of Commerce and Industry must hold a regular inter-ministerial meetings. Further, regular interaction with state government is also crucial so that trade facilitation takes place under cooperative federalism. Next suggestion is hand-holding support to MSME to have access to use appropriate technology to boost exports. Next is to increase access to formal finance. Why? Because currently less than 4% of small firms in India have access to formal finance in comparison to 21% in US, China, Vietnam, Sri Lanka, etc. Next is to reorient CES and this suggestion is by Baba Kalyani Committee. According to it, CES should be renamed as 3Es, Employment and Economic Enclaves. Why? Because focus should not only be on boosting exports, but also on employment creation and GDP growth rate. Also, incentive given to companies in said should depend upon factors such as value addition, technology adoption, etc. as this will encourage the companies to innovate and complete at the global level. Last is integration into global value chains. Why? To invite large anchor firms in critical products to set up operation in India. Government has already taken initiative in this regard like simplified labor laws, low corporate tax on new manufacturing operations and scrapping of retrospective tax. As these steps would encourage firms searching for China plus one location to shift base to India. Now let's take up the next article which appeared on page number 15 in the Indian Express dated 15th February. This article is about the Office of Deputy Speaker and constitutional provisions related to it. The context of this article is that the Supreme Court has issued notice to the center and five states that is Rajasthan, Uttarakhand, Madhya Pradesh, Uttar Pradesh and Jharkhand over the failure to elect the Deputy Speaker. Also, a bench led by a Chief Justice of India sought a response on a PIL that contends that not electing a deputy speaker to the current Lok Sabha, that is 17th Lok Sabha, is against the letter and spirit of the constitution. Now, presiding officers is important part of parliament and state legislature and this is one of the important theme under GS paper 2. Also, there was a question based on speaker came in 2018. This theme is important from May's perspective also as there was a question in 2020 about speaker. So now try to attempt this question and let us know your answer in the comment box given below. So let's start our discussion with the constitutional provisions with respect to speaker. The first one is article 93. Article 93 says the house of the people shall as soon as maybe choose two members of the house to be respectively speaker and deputy speaker. Now mark these words carefully. Why? Because entire conundrum between center and state over the appointment of deputy speaker is based on these terms. How? Let me tell you. A shall term indicates that election of speaker and deputy speaker is mandatory under the constitution. However, term as soon as may be reflects more about indecisiveness and it is right because it does not lay down a specific time frame within which election for the post of speaker and deputy speaker is to be conducted. Next is rule number 8 of the rules of procedure and conduct of business in Lok Sabha. According to this rule, the election of deputy speaker shall be held on such a date as the speaker may fix. 
so here also case of election of deputy speaker is speaker's discretion next is article 95 clause 1 if the office of speaker is vacant the duties of the office shall be performed by the deputy speaker now you have understood that why this article is in news and what are the reasons behind this debate now let's see other relevant constitutional provisions with respect to speaker and deputy speaker next is article 94 it talks about vacation and resignation and removal from the office of speaker and deputy speaker and this can be done first is if he ceases to be a member of the house of the people that is lok sabha now as you know that speaker and deputy speaker must be a member of lok sabha so once he ceases to be a member he cannot be deputy speaker speaker anymore then next is deputy speaker and speaker at any time can address his resignation if he is speaker he can submit resignation to deputy speaker if such a member is deputy speaker he can submit his resignation to speaker next is may be removed from his office by a resolution of the house of the people passed by effective majority that is majority of all the then members of the house and such resolution cannot be passed without providing 14 days prior notice then next is whenever the house of the people is dissolved speaker shall not vacate his office until immediately before the first meeting of the house after the dissolution so once the house is dissolved speaker shall not vacate when he will vacate before the first meeting of the house after the dissolution next power is casting vote speaker or deputy speaker can exercise vote only in case of tie and not in first tense to maintain the impartiality then next is deputy speaker is a member of general purpose committee and library committee he is the ex officio chairperson of the committee so whatever powers we have read till now go same with the speaker and deputy speaker of the legislative assembly now let's solve this pyq based on deputy speaker of lok sabha which came in year 2022 the first statement is as per the rules of procedure and conduct of business in lok sabha the election of deputy speaker shall be held on such a date as the speaker may fix this we have already read try to recall rule number eight in which we have read that election of deputy speaker shall be held on such a date as the speaker may fix so our statement one is correct so your correct answer must entail statement one so here only two options are left that is a and b so now Let's come to the second statement. There is a mandatory provision that the election of a candidate as a deputy speaker of Lok Sabha shall be from either the principal opposition party or the ruling party. This statement is incorrect. Why? Because there is no mandatory provision. This is a convention. Although in practice so far, deputy speaker has been chosen mostly from opposition party. So here our correct answer is option A. So till now we have discussed the constitutional provisions and we already know why there is a rift between center and state over deputy speaker. So now the question is can the court intervene? Answer is no because according to article 122 the validity of any proceedings in the parliament shall not be called in question on the ground of any alleged irregularity of procedure. So is there any alternative? Yes, according to rule 9 of the rules of procedure and conduct of business in Lok Sabha, the speaker shall nominate from amongst the members a panel of not more than 10 chairpersons and any one of whom may preside over the house in the absence of speaker and deputy speaker. And what's the current government stand? According to them, there is no immediate requirement for a deputy speaker as bills are being passed and discussions are being held as normal in the house. Now, in this part, we have taken up prelims pointers, which are sourced from various news that are featured in the Hindu newspaper dated 19 February. Now, pay attention that these statements are pointers for you to remember. However, these statements can be used to frame questions in MCQ. So, the first news is about GST Appellate Tribunal which appeared on page 1. The context of this news is that GST Council has reached a broad consensus on the long-awaited constitution of the GST Appellate Tribunal to resolve the rising number of disputes under the 68th month old indirect tax regime. 
that are now clogging high courts and other judicial fora. Now, the first statement is, it is a comprehensive multi-stage destination based indirect tax. Now, GST is comprehensive. Why? Because it has subsumed almost all the indirect taxes. It is multi-stage as it is imposed at every step in the production process, but is meant to be refunded to all parties other than the final consumer. And it is a destination-based tax as it is collected from point of consumption and not point of origin like previous taxes. So this statement is correct. Second statement is the main idea behind creation of GST was to usher in the era of value added taxes. Now the rationale for GST is to have one India, one market, one tax, removing the cascading effect of value added tax and to create a unified economic market. So this statement is incorrect. Now next news is about rhododendrons and it appeared on page 9. According to this article, the latest publication of the Botanical Survey of India reveals that Darjeeling and Sikkim are home to more than one third of all types of rhododendrons found in India. Now the first statement is, of the four parallel ranges in Himalayas, rhododendrons are practically absent in the Greater Himalayas. A few are found in Lesser Himalayas and a majority of them are in Shivaliks. Now this statement is incorrect. Why? Because rhododendrons of India are widely distributed in different regions and altitudes mainly in Himalayas. Of the four parallel ranges in Himalayas, they are practically absent in Shivaliks and not in Greater Himalayas. And few are found in Lesser Himalayas and majority of them are found in Greater Himalayas. Now let's come to the second statement. It is a state tree of Uttarakhand and state flower of Nagaland. Now this statement is correct as it is a state tree of Uttarakhand and state flower of Nagaland. Now our next article based on avian influenza and it appeared on page number 11. Now according to this article, the world's largest northern gannet colony at the Bass Rock, an island of the coast of North Berwick, Scotland has been recently decimated by avian influenza or H5N1 virus or bird flu. Now, you should know that humans can be infected with avian swine or other zoonotic influenza viruses such as avian influenza virus subtypes A, H5N1, H7N9, H9N2. Now, let's come to the first statement. Human infections of avian influenza are primarily acquired through direct contact with infected animals or contaminated environments. These viruses have not acquired the ability of sustained transmission among humans. This statement is true. Now let's come to the second statement. Influenza type A viruses are classified into subtypes according to the combinations of different virus genetic code that is hemagglutinin HA and neuraminidase that is NA. Now this statement is incorrect. Why? Because it is based on surface proteins and not based on genetic code. Now our next article is based on stock market and it appeared on page number 12. According to this article, on February 10, the Supreme Court asked the SEBI, that is Securities and Exchange Board of India and the government to produce the existing regulatory framework in place to protect investors from share market volatility. After short seller Hindenburg Research published a report in January accusing the Adani group of stock market manipulation and accounting fraud, its shares plummeted and investors were reported to have lost lakhs of crores. Now let's come to the first statement. Stock exchanges in India are regulated by SEBI while commodities markets are regulated by union government. Now you should know that securities market in India is regulated by four key laws. Companies Act 2013. Second is Securities and Exchange Board of India Act 1992. Next is Security Contracts Regulation Act 1956 that is SCRA and the last is Depositories Act 1996. Now the framing of these laws reflects the evolution and development of capital market in India. Now Securities Contracts Regulation Act 1956 has empowered SEBI to recognize and regulate stock exchanges and later commodity exchanges in India. This was earlier done by union government. So this statement is incorrect. Now let's come to the second statement. The Securities Contracts Regulation Act 1956 empowers SEBI to recognize and de-recognize stock exchanges, prescribe rules and bylaws for their functioning and regulate trading clearing and settlement on stock exchanges. 
Now this statement is correct. Now that's all for today. Stay tuned for more such updates.